Hi, good morning. Happy Friday. Well done to the survivors. Um, this is a really good turnout, thank you. Have you had a good week? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's, that's cheating, pure self-gratification. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and my final bit of fun for the week is to introduce, I think, the person that I have heard speak on the widest range of topics. Um, I've heard Miranda talk about environmental history. I've heard her talk about deep legal theory. And this morning, she's going to talk about AI, IoT, and stuff. <laughs> Dr. Miranda Mowbray, University of Bristol. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the organizers, firstly, for inviting me. I am thrilled to be here. Um, and secondly, for all their hard work. Um, I'm thrilled to be here because this is a great community. I, I, I've never been to this conference before, but to have this kind of really open, friendly atmosphere with a conference this size means you're doing something really great that not many conferences manage to pull off. I'm also thrilled that I get to, to give the talk about Internet of Things security called Things That Go Bump in the Night. I've wanted to use this talk, this title, for about two years. And for two years, when everyone brings out a new paper um, about Internet of Things security, I look for the title and go, no, they're going to take the title. I've got it. And this is a conference in Scotland. This is a uh, part of a Scottish prayer. And I'll give you the Scottish prayer. So uh, I claim this title for mine. Uh, it will be about security for the Internet of Things, where the Internet of Things is uh, uh, anything, any physical object with embedded computing and wireless connection. So very, very general. And I've had help from my assistant, Amin Balalu, who's a first year student, I believe, in mentoring. So I got him to choose some of the examples. I'm going to show you some examples of attacks and vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, I will also show you some graphs done by my PhD student, um, Abir Amin, um, who's, looking, uh, who's doing a PhD on statistical security for the Internet of Things. Compared to the other Internet of Things talks, this will say a little bit more about detection, but it'll be pretty high level, so you won't have to have your brains very engaged on this uh, last talk of the conference. Okay, this is where the title comes from. It's a Scottish prayer that you say at night, uh, from ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night, good Lord preserve us. It's anonymous. For those of you who don't speak Go Scottish English, I will translate. Uh, ghoulies are little ghouls. They're, they're nasty, malicious creatures, so they're like attackers. Uh, ghosties are little ghosts. Uh, there will be a ghost story in this talk. Long-leggedy beasties are... Uh, I, I'm not sure what they are, but they're, they're small creatures with long legs. Sounds a bit nightmarish and scary. And things that go bump in the night, that is obviously things in the Internet of Things that have security problems or are misbehaving in some way. Uh, good Lord preserve us. If the good Lord doesn't preserve us, then we need the help of all the incident response teams. So thank you all. OK, uh, one of my students said, I'm probably the person in the world who does least with the Internet of Things. All my friends do more. So I said, OK, what do you do more, Sonny? Uh, his name is Sonny Minlani. Uh, well, he has Alexa, he has a smart bulb, and he has a fan, and they're all coordinated uh, with his phone and do proximity sensing and a setup. So this is the absolute baseline for a final year computer science student in the Internet of Things. Uh, this is the first toothbrush with artificial intelligence. And the reason why they have to say that it's the first toothbrush with artificial intelligence is that there is more than one toothbrush with artificial intelligence. I know of three brands of toothbrush with artificial intelligence. What a wonderful world we live in. <laughs> OK, so uh, this is evidence that the, the Internet of Things on the consumer side is growing like Topsy. Uh, as you all know, uh, I'm sure on the um, uh, industrial side, it's growing even faster on the um, uh, within companies. Um, so. The rest of the talk, I will talk about some attacks and vulnerabilities. Uh, I'll have a historical interlude about Talos. 
I will talk about weather stations and doing anomaly detection for weather stations. And the, the point of that bit is to show you that when you find statistical anomalies, they may not be attacks, they may be misconfigurations or other interesting things, but you still might want to know about them. Uh, then I'll talk about um, some uh, um, stuff that's being done by my PhD student um, with a motion sensor. I'll talk more generally about different classes of ways in which you might detect things going bump in the night, things misbehaving. Um, then I'll have another historical interlude, since we all have to talk about defending the castle, I will talk about defending the castle. And then I'll have a final section about the state of, of security for the Internet of Things, what we might do about it. Okay, and before I start the, the main part of the talk, if I mention your company, your, your uh, company that you're working for, you can come up to me afterwards and claim some real Scottish shortbread, because there are lots of people uh, until my shortbread runs out, because there are lots of people doing really great work, uh, and some of you are at this conference. I want to say thank you. Okay, some attacks and vulnerabilities. Uh, I love this one. This was uh, an attack through the thermometer in a smart fish tank. It was a casino that had a large fish tank, and it had a thermometer which was connected uh, to the rest of the internet, and uh, 10 gigabytes of data was exfiltrated through this thermometer. So this was an actual phishing attack. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> it was found by Darktrace, so if there's anyone working for Darktrace, you can have shortbread. Uh, this has been mentioned in Ken Munro's wonderful keynote, which I missed. Um, but he, he and other people found problems with this um, unbreakable smart lock. This wonderful headline is from the register. Okay, so I won't say much about that because he talked about that. Uh, this is Belkin Wemo. Uh, that's a Belkin Wemo smart plug looking sad, <laughs> right? Wonderfully, if you go on Flickr, you can find a picture of a Belkin Wemo smart plug looking sad, which is uh, Creative Commons. Um, so uh, in August last year, McAfee uh, did a blog where they talked about some vulnerabilities, and he said, is Belkin Wemo smart plug the next malware target? And in April, it was discovered, yes, it was. Bashlight software was up, up, updated to make use of these vulnerabilities. So McAfee and Trend Micro, anyone there? Shortbread. Uh, keyless car theft. Cars are things, right? They've got lots of embedded computing, and they uh, communicate wirelessly. And uh, the keyless cars, where you unlock them with a, a key fob or your smartphone, there's an attack uh, called a keyless relay attack, where the, the signal from the fob is uh, amplified from, from inside your house, and they can relay it to the car that's parked outside your house. So they stand outside your house, re relay the signal, and use it to unlo unlock your car. And this has led to UK car theft claims being the highest since 2012, uh, and it's mostly keyless relay attacks. So 92% of the cars recovered in Essex. For those of you who don't know, Essex is, is um, a center for the used car trade. Um, in the UK were, were stolen in this way. So all of those of you who are driving cars in the UK, you're paying for this through your insurance. Uh, this is one that happened just this month. Monsieur Cuisine, which is a cooking robot. It can do all sorts of things. It, it slices, it dices, it chops, it heats, it does asparagus. It's, it's amazing. Um, uh, it turns out it was, it's using the Android 6.0 Marshmallow operating system, which is no longer patched. And there's an undocumented microphone, which is not used, because they wanted to coordinate it with Alexa, but they decided not to do that. So there's a microphone in there. So you can use these machines to do phone calls. Fantastic. Um, and this is a video of somebody using this machine to watch YouTube while they're cooking. Uh, this is great fun when you do it for yourself. It's maybe not so fun if a hacker decides, oh, sorry, I should say a cracker. Hackers are good. Um, uh, if, if a nasty little ghoulie uh, tries to um, take over your cooking robot. 
And the last example I'm going to give, so these two colourful pictures, the one on the right is from Ann Arbor, which is where the University of Michigan is. The one on the left is a dance called Frevo, dance with little umbrellas. It's a fantastic dance, and it's from Hesif, uh, where the University of Pernambuco is. You should all dance Frevo, you won't regret it. Um, I can't do it anymore because I have middle-aged knees, but you should all do it. Uh, and these two universities, uh, what they did was they looked at the 96 top-selling things on Amazon, which, and they looked at their companion apps, 32 of them, because some things share apps. Actually, some apps share things as well, but many things share apps. Um, and they looked at the communication channel between the app and the device. And, well, 31% uh, of them, there was no encryption of this channel. 19% of them, it's, there are hard-coded keys which you can recover by reverse engineering the app. Um, and this is half the apps, or 38% of the things. Now, uh, I think it's important to say that the attack that this allows, uh, first, the attacker has to get onto your local network. So you may say, well, if they're on the local network anyway, well, uh, um, but um, so from, from the local network, they can use this to get onto your, app, uh, your uh, device, your thing. Um, uh, but as the paper points out, and I actually agree based on um, uh, work done by my colleagues in Hewlett Packard when I worked in Hewlett Packard, if they get this wrong, probably they'll get lots of other things wrong. If you find a thing where the, companion, uh, the communication with the companion app isn't properly secure, probably there are other problems with security problems with the thing based on experience. Okay, so that's the end of the examples. Uh, partly picked by my assistant. Now I'm going to have a historical interlude, and it's about Talos. So this is a modern sculpture of Talos. Um, does anyone know what century the myth of Talos comes from? Yeah, we had a hand up? No, we didn't. <laughs> okay, uh, whatever you guessed, it's probably earlier. It's the third century BC. So this is the earliest story that I know about security of the Internet of Things. And it's actually about attacks on the security of the Internet of Things. So Talos was a thing. Talos was a giant made entirely of bronze. And he had one wire, or vein, from the top of his head to his toe. And his life fluid, uh, his e-core, the, the life force, flowed through that. So that's what made him active. Uh, and he was the burglar alarm for the island of Crete. So, uh, oh, this is from the story of Jason and the Argonauts, by the way. Uh, he was the burglar alarm for the island of Crete. Three times a day, he walked around the whole of the island. Crete's a pretty big island, but he was a giant. And he would look for ships that were coming to invade the island, and he would throw rocks at them to sink them. So this is hacking back. Don't do that. <coughs> Jason and the Argonauts wanted to come and explore the island, but they didn't want the Argo to be sunk by Talos. So they did a remote social engineering attack. Uh, there was Medea who was traveling with Jason and the Argonauts, and she had social engineering powers, and she remotely hypnotized Talos. She hypnotized Talos, and that meant that she could remove the pin in his toe. The pin in his toe was what kept the wire and his, his life force uh, um, applied to him. So when she removed this bronze pin, he, uh, he was bricked, he was bronzed, he turned into a heap of metal, and they could explore the island. So this is a story from the third century BC about the security of the Internet of Things, the, proper, uh, the importance of protecting your, uh, your security devices, uh, and the dangers of social engineering. Uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, you've come across the name Talos before because uh, Talos Intelligence is the security part of Cisco, the security team of Cisco, and they've done some really nice work in this area, finding vulnerabilities in attacks. Uh, recently, they find vulnerabilities in the Cujo smart firewall for the Internet of Things. So this is very much the same story as Talos. There's a problem with the security. So if you don't have a smart firewall on your things, you're vulnerable. If you do have this smart firewall, you're vulnerable. Um, and it's called Cujo, which was a rabid dog. Anyway. <clears throat> so the, uh, the next section is uh, about some work I did looking at anomaly detection on weather stations. So these are weather sensors. They, they sense dust levels, moisture levels, light levels. They have uh, latitude and longitude, oh, temperature. 
So uh, these were weather stations in universities, and there's pretty much no motivation for attacking a weather station in a university. You might want to attack a weather station maybe if you were a rival farmer and you wanted another farmer to, to get the wrong um, information about what to do, when to water their crops, something like that, but in a university, no. Um, so any anomalies that I find are unlikely to be attacks, but I wanted to see what I could find anyway. So this is, uh, the, oh, the data's public, and it's from 85 dust centers, sensors in seven cities. And this is a tale of two dust sensors. Um, what I was doing was pretty bog standard st statistical anomaly detection. I was just seeing things that were statistically unusual. And this is two dust sensors. So the x-axis is time, the y-axis is uh, dust reading. Two dust sensors that have very unusual dust readings with th those peaks, and you can see it's about the same time. And, uh, okay, however, there's something weird about it. Because according to the latitude and longitude, one is in London, and the other one is in Boston. So if they were both in Boston, this could be a lorry unloading uh, their load or a building site or something. Um, but something weird is going on. Okay, and then a little bit later, the sensor that was in London hops in five minutes to Antarctica. And you can see that it's a long, uh, from this scale, you, that's the bottom of, that's South Africa, you can see at the top. So this is, this is a very, very large scale. Um, it's a way inland in Antarctica. It's nowhere near any research stations. And it's just hopped there. So it's a hop, uh, I've talked about long legged beasties. This is a very, very long hop. Uh, okay, what's going on? Well, if you look at the latitude and longitude readings for where it said it was in Antarctica, and you change them round, <laughs> it's in Boston. <laughs> and it's near MIT like the other one. And I think it was in Boston all along. So why did it say it was in London? Well, here's where it said that it was in London. So anyone see where that is? It says it's in number 10 Downing Street. So for those of you who don't know, that's the residence of the British Prime Minister. So what I think is, uh, it's kind of unlikely that, that the research weather station should be in the residence of the British Prime Minister and then in Boston. Um, so what I think is, this was the default setting. And it was set at the default readings of number 10 Downing Street, just to say, of, of course, this is not a real reading. Um, and then it was reset to be where it was supposed to be, except somebody misconfigured it and got the latitude and longitude the wrong way around. This is not the only dust sensor that has unusual latitude and longitude readings. There's a dust sensor in the University of Rio that takes a trip up to the top of the Sugarloaf Mountain stays there for a bit and then comes back down again. And I think that was real readings. I think that probably a researcher thought it would be nice to see what the weather was like at the top of the Sugarloaf Mountain as an, uh, uh, an excuse to go up there. Um, uh, but it's really useful if you have a thing to know if it's going walkabout because one common attack that, that commonly happens to things, if they're portable, is people steal them and you can uh, tell where their location is and see whether their location is where it ought not to be. Right, this is something going bump in the night. Uh, so that, uh, you can see from the, the key that, that actually there are an awful lot of light sensors plotted here, but apart from one, they all say zero because this is the middle of the night. Uh, but there's one <laughs> that suddenly has a reading that is larger than the tropical sun at midday. Bump! <laughs> okay, so what I think this is, is a local power surge. It might possibly be somebody taking a blowtorch to, to try and uh, attack the thing, but it's, uh, given the duration, it's more likely a local power surge. And normally, if you're doing um, uh, data analysis, automated data analysis, you just throw away this data, right? It's, it's anomalous. You just clean the data and you clean away anything like that. But I think it's useful useful to keep and make use of this data because firstly, uh, in some cases, not this case, it might be an, an attack. And in this case, you might want to know that there had been a local power surge that might have affected your, your sensor because after that it could be fried. It could be um, having readings that you really should discard. 
So uh, if you're, you're monitoring and collecting data from the Internet of Things, maybe you want to keep some of the um, uh, extreme readings that you're throwing away and just saying, well, that doesn't make sense. Okay, so uh, conclusions. Uh, statistical anomalies, anomaly is used in different ways in different parts of the industry. I mean statistical anomalies, which means just things that are very rare. That's all it means uh, in normal behavior. And they may be unusual but benign, and I've showed you some that are unusual but benign. They may be misconfigurations, in which case maybe you want to know about them. Um, and apart from some attacks, so some attacks are designed to be seen, DDoS, designed to be seen, um, but there are a lot of attacks that are designed not to be seen. They're, they're low and slow and stealthy. So if you're just looking for the most unusual behavior, you may only pick up the misconfigurations and benign stuff. So what you should do is instead of just looking for the most extreme anomalies, you should look for anomalies that uh, are anomalies that are fit with attack behavior. So that you can't do an attack without having a, a high, uh, unusually high read, uh, you can't do an attack efficiently without having an unusually high reading of what you're looking at, for example. Uh, or you can use weirdness detection just as, to filter out your data anyway, so you only look at things that are uh, fairly unusual, and then you do more analysis on that. But I don't recommend that you take your data from the Internet of Things and say that uh, the largest anomalies are the ones you ought to look for. You'll find you're only looking at, or mainly looking at, misconfigurations. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some work from my PhD student. She's looking at statistical anomaly in the Internet of Things, and I'll show you some data from a motion sensor going bump. Um, this is a Wemo motion sensor, and this is normal behavior, right? Uh, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is uh, the number of packets sent um, in a small time interval. And you can see that there's a, one small time interval that looks pretty anomalous. It's normal behavior. And so if you want uh, peaks around 40. So if you want to do uh, typical threshold detection, you're going to have to send your, your uh, unless you want quite a lot of um, a high rate of false positives. If you're comfortable with that, that's fine. But if you're not comfortable with that, you're going to have to have your threshold above that 40 level. And that means that there's lots of white space in that diagram on the left-hand side where an attacker could send out extra packets <coughs> Uh, they could be attack packets, they could be for command and control, without being detected. So the idea is to do something that can also detect low and slow attacks, uh, which also increase the amount of packets, because uh, most of the attacks we're thinking of would, uh, if the, um, if the, uh, the, sen the, the no motion sensor is then used to attack or to laterally move um, to some other um, thing or system, then uh, you're going to see the outgoing packets that try to do that. Use the, uh, right, the CCDF, don't worry about that, it's statistics. Uh, you use that to estimate the threshold for a Q length, assuming that you are serving the packets at a particular rate. So you're going to have this mythical rate at which you might be serving the packets, and you're going to work out the Q length if you were serving the packets at that rate, what the Q length would currently be. And that's a very, very lightweight calculation. OK. So what you do is you take a sample of normal traffic, or you, you just um, uh, update your models every so often, uh, assuming that there usually won't be an attack, um, and uh, find a Q length where it's very unlikely that if you had been serving them at one packet a second, you would get a Q length that would, would be larger than that. OK, and then you give a, uh, an alert or a warning that will not be alert by itself. You'll feed it in and combine it with other suspicious things about what's going on um, before you send it to, to any one of you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, if the Q length, the notional Q length that you would have got if you've been serving these packets at a lower rate uh, exceeds that threshold. So the next graph I'm going to show you is different scale to this one. So the top of this one is 400. The top of the next one will be much, much higher. OK. Oh, sorry. No, no this is the same. Um, this is the Q length uh, versus time. So this is as you serve traffic at a Q length of uh, one packet a second with normal traffic, you can see the Q length bounces up and down. 
but it remains bounded. And uh, my PhD student worked out for this data the, the threshold you want to earn for a reasonable probability. The, the threshold that you want to give is 1,250, I think. And the next graph will be much uh, higher. Uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the top of the graph will be a much larger number than just 400. OK, so this black line is 1,250. And this is what happens to the notional Q length when there's a sin flood attack. You can see the notional Q length just keeps on rising and very quickly reaches the threshold because there's more traffic in uh, a period of time and the, the Q length keeps on rising. So if you use different um, uh, notional... Uh, uh, yeah, if you uh, do different imagined service rates, you can both detect... Um, very uh, bursty attacks um, very quickly, and you can detect slow and slower attacks after a bit of a longer time. Okay, so I've given um, one example of a way to hear the bump, and now I'm going to talk it more in general about general ways in which you might do detection of problems in the Internet of Things, with the caveat that I said before, you shouldn't just look for the most anomalous anomalies. Right, so... Uh, what I did was I looked at reports of real attacks, not just vulnerabilities on the Internet of Things, and I thought about how, either how they were detected or how you might detect them, um, um, whether there were other ways in which you might detect them. And the first category is broken rules. Now, I don't think these should be used for detection. These are things that really shouldn't ever happen to your thing. I think they should be used for prevention, and maybe uh, you log and monitor if, if they're broken, but you should stop them from happening. And there's more scope in things uh, than in traditional um, computing networks because uh, in the Internet of Things, each individual thing usually has a more restricted behavior. Now, lots of, uh, there's only a certain, certain type of behavior that it should ever have, and you should prevent it from having other types of behavior. But if it, if it asks to do that, then you should block it. Okay. So these are broken rules, and I think there's a lot... Uh, the, something that gives me hope is there's uh, a lot of scope for preventing bad things happening through broken rules in the Internet of Things that there isn't in more traditional computing. The second uh, set is suspicious com combinations. So this is where there are actions where it's not just one action by one thing, but it's a combination of actions by multiple things, or it's multiple actions by the same thing. And again, I think there's maybe more scope uh, uh, in the Internet of Things where we have a lot, particularly in the industrial Internet of Things, where there are uh, lots of things that are quite similar. You would expect to have similar behavior, such as dust sensors in the same city at about the same time. You can have some localized weather, but you, you're unlikely to have exactly the same dust peak if they're in different cities. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, a lot of vendors are doing things, and there was a nice talk about attacking the castle that talked about combining uh, indicators from different parts of the attack matrix. I think we could be doing more of that. Some of that is being automated, but I think there's scope for more sophisticated comp piecing together of, uh, less like, of um, uh, weaker indicators um, from different parts of the attack matrix or the kill cycle. And some of those are about lateral movement, as you can probably see. Third thing is weirdness, uh, statistical anomaly detection. And in uh, the Internet of Things, if you have several things that ought to behave similarly, as well as looking at things that are very rare given your past behavior of that thing, you can look at things that are very rare given what other things that uh, ought to logically to be behaving similarly. You can look at big differences between one thing and the other things that ought to be behaving similarly. Um, and uh, there are some examples there. The last one is uh, thing sending out weirdly large volumes of data, and there was a nice talk about um, other ways of statistical detection of DNS exfiltration. So an example where, I, uh, where we detected it just based on data, uh, data volume anomalies, um, unfortunately, we never managed to confirm that this was really the case. But when I was working at Hewlett-Packard, we noticed something in a network that um, Hewlett-Packard was um, managing. 
where the most likely explanation was data exfiltration by an internet-connected forklift truck. Uh, one example of, uh, sub-example of weirdness is things going bump in the night, yes. Uh, so this is a behavior that might be quite usual if it was happening during office hours, but it's happening at an unusual time of day or in the middle of the night. Um, so configuration changes, admin logins, password changes, uh, similar actions by multiple things, login attempts. Uh, all of those can, uh, are not necessarily suspicious if you see them the day, but if you see a lot of them at, 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 at a particular time of night, that's suspicious. Uh, and an example of this is uh, well, another historical interlude. This is from 2000, the Marucci Shah sewage incident. Um, put your hands if you haven't heard of that. Yeah, oh, lots of people haven't heard of that. Okay, this is uh, a problem with uh, industrial control systems in 2000. Um, and uh, there was a contractor working for Marucci uh, in, um, uh, it's, it's in Australia. Um, and he was helping install radio-operated sewage equi equipment. And he was turned down for uh, a job in the council. And in revenge, he released, he fiddled with the, the controls and released a huge amount of raw sewage into the environment, which is really not nice. Um, there's a really good write-up there. Um, and one of the ways that it was determined, uh, that it was detected Firstly, that this was actually malicious and just not, not just faulty equipment, was uh, uh, he was doing multiple configuration changes during the night. That was spotted, and that led to his arrest. Okay. Now I'm going to do another historical interlude, which is about defending the castle. Uh, since this is the theme of the conference, I thought I'd tell you about a castle that I know a little bit about. This is Bamborough Castle. It's, it's um, on the east coast of England. It's just near the border. And I know about it because my grandmother used to live there. She rented a flat from the family who own it. You can see that uh, a, a terrific feature of this castle is the threat intelligence. You can, you can see for miles around in all directions. Um, this is the other side of the castle. Um, there's a really strong perimeter wall. It's six feet thick, made of stone. Um, it's uh, crunchy on the inside as well, so defense in depth, you see that square tower, uh, that is the keep. If you want to get to the important people, you have to get through the perimeter wall and into the keep, which is well defended as well. But I want to say uh, two features of this that are not normally pointed out as security features. Um, and one of them is the windmill. You can just, uh, you can see, if you look to the keep, it's uh, to the right of it. It's actually outside the wall, um, but it, uh, it could have been inside the wall. And it was built in the 18th century, and that was a bit late, because in the 15th century, during the Wars of the Roses, there was a siege of Bamber Castle, and Bamber Castle fell to a siege. Actually, it was besieged twice, but uh, the first time it fell to a siege rather than cannon fire. Um, and uh, they were prepared for a short siege, but not for a long siege. And in a long siege, the important thing is you, you have your food and water supply. Well, the water supply comes from the heavens in Northumbria every day. Um, uh, but uh, if they'd had the windmill and a supply of corn, they could have kept on producing bread to feed the troops for much lo and survived longer until their reinforcements came in the War of the Roses. They might have survived that siege. And the lesson for this for security is, is of course, do your tabletop exercises, do your long-term planning, um, have your resources in place for when the worst happens. Okay. And the second thing I want to say is the ghost story. So uh, uh, there's a story that's repeated by a lot of people and happened to a relative of mine, that they're walking around Bambra Castle late at night. They hear some steps behind them, footsteps behind them. The footsteps get nearer and nearer. They turn around. There's no one there. And they look in the, uh, whether there's an alcove in the corridor that, where somebody might have be hiding. No, nothing there. This has been repeated a lot of times. So it was a family story in, in our family, and then I, I looked up online, I, I saw it was report, reported by a lot of other people. Now, I don't believe in ghosts. I think this is acoustic. So I think uh, Bamber Castle, you can see it's stone. Um, the, the echoes of footsteps echo pretty well off the walls, and the walls are at unusual angles within the castle. 
I think probably the sound of the footsteps gets echoed and sent somewhere else. And you hear them behind you, but they're actually coming from another direction. Now think of this as a security defense. If you're invading this castle, you hear the sound of footsteps behind you uh, or coming from one direction. You flee away from it. You flee straight into the arms of the guard because you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, maybe we could do that, some, some, something like that, uh, um, as a sort of anti-honeypot. We have honeypots which attract uh, attackers to go to a part of our castle that we want them to stay in that's easy to defend um, and we can monitor them easily. Maybe we could also repel them, have a, a stick as well as a carrot. But the other thing it rinds, reminds me of, so that's just an idea for you, I don't know anyone wants to take it up or anyone is already doing this. Um, the other thing that re reminds me of is being scared of your own shadow. So another thing that might happen is you're attacking the castle with a group of other soldiers uh, and you hear the, this, the noise of soldiers approaching, <laughs> so you back away, but it's actually somebody from your own party with the, the echo being reflected round. And that has happened to me <laughs> in network security. In fact, uh, I, I worked in network security for long enough uh, looking at ways of detecting attacks that I came to the conclusion that if you have an attack detection method on a network that doesn't finger the network security team or the network security researchers as probable, probable attackers, then it's not sensitive enough. And maybe some of you have had this experience. Um, uh, and the reason is that network security researchers do a lot of things that if they were done by normal people, it would be really bad. <laughs> okay, I talked about windmills, more about windmills. So uh, windmills, of course, are things. They're things in the Internet of Things. Wind turbines, they have internal computing and they have wireless connections. Um, and this is a story from David Rogers of uh, Copper Horse. Um, so there was a set of wind turbines in a very inaccessible location. And there's this really ingenious attack where somebody reprogrammed them to dial a premium rate phone number. Not fantastic. And it wasn't discovered until the bill was maxed out and the, the maximum amount for the bill was absolutely huge. <laughs> uh, and this is Jason Staggs on wind farms. This is from a DEF CON talk um, two years ago. So he and uh, his co-authors looked at security of wind farms and they found, well, you can see, it's pretty bad. Um, and the kicker is the last thing he said. This is exactly what we would expect from industrial control systems. <laughs> okay, state of security of the Internet of Things. What do we think? Good, medium, bad? Anyone like to vote? Uh, yeah, I don't see many thumbs up. <laughs> so what I think is, it's pants. Um, <laughs> Right, so for those of you who are not fluent in British English, pants means not very good. It doesn't mean terrible, it means just not very good. I think it's better than it was. Uh, and pants also means underwear. This is a pair of Arduino-enabled disco pants. <laughs> the coloured LEDs, they flash on and off in the dark. <laughs> it's fabulous. Um, I don't know of any security problems with this, which is just as well. You don't want security problems with your underwear. <laughs> the reason I'm showing you is when you think about the state of the security of the Internet of Things, uh, you can get a bit gloomy, and I wanted to cheer you up. Okay, so why is it so pants? <laughs> why do we have pants security in the Internet of Things? Well, firstly, it's, it's new technology, or a lot of it is. So a lot of uh, consumer or, or industrial um, Internet of Things systems. They're trying to do something that nobody managed to do before. They're introducing completely new functionality. When you introduce completely new fun functionality, a new product line, you're trying to make the thing work. All your effort is trying to make the thing at least not fall over. Um, and security can suffer because of that. Um, in other cases, uh, there was an old product which was perfectly secure. Uh, and its security model had no connection. <laughs> And now it's been hooked up, you're increasing the attack surface, um, and it's no longer secure. Another thing that I think will be a problem with us for a while is early things are still in use. So early things, uh, 
so uh, later versions of the things are secure, but there are early things that are still in operation. They're still out there. They're still being attacked. Um, some things, depending on what it does, have limited computing resources or, or storage, or with the industrial um, control systems, uh, you, uh, you, you, um, they have to have very, very quick response time. You don't have the option of um, turning it off and turning it on again quickly. If you do that with a steel mill, it takes six months. Um, there's a big attack surface. It's not just the physical thing. It's also the local network. It's also the, um, uh, the, uh, it, uh, the network interface. Uh, it's also the UI, if there's a UI. And it's combinations of all of these. Um, there are large supply chains, large and long supply chains. If you, can, you have a thing, it could be developed in, by small teams, lots and lots of different small teams developing different layers based in different countries. None of those teams have a security expert, and all of those teams might inadvertently leave in a problem. Um, there are problems with patch development and distribution with some kinds of things. <laughs> you can't really update them. Um, but others, you could, but they don't really have a good process for doing so. And the last thing is, a few companies not even trying. I'm thinking in particular of privacy. There are some privacy architectures, which would, uh, architectures for some types of things that would, I'm thinking, yeah, um, uh, particularly uh, consumer things where the business model is you collect as much data as possible with the consent of, of the user. Um, and that means that they have an architecture that is less private than if you were going just for, for privacy. OK, so here are some suggestions. Um, uh, the, for, uh, right, I should say, I've already talked about detection. I have not said anything about incident response because I would feel ridiculous saying it in front of this audience. But you do need that. <laughs> um, uh, if, for those of you who are working with small and medium-sized companies, one thing that you can do is help them get better security development processes or more security development processes. There are also uh, security platforms for the Internet of Things. And this is good because it means that they don't have to have all the expertise in-house. They can build on what other people have, have done. Um, you can also help them get a process for responding to a vulnerability report. Um, some of them really want to do the right thing, but they just don't have a good process in place. And they haven't thought through and they haven't talked with their supply chain about what happens when the vulnerability report comes in and how they deal with it. I'd like to give kudos to Siemens, who do this really well. Um, I think we should be thinking about business models, alternative business models than just snarfing all the, the data in the world. Um, uh, and using it for advertising. I think that there are more imaginative business models out there for consumer things, also for industrial things. Um, don't fund insecure things. So uh, there's been this uh, unfortunate um, fact that it's really easy to get funding to, to build a new thing, but it's really expensive to get funding to make uh, the thing secure. Don't do it. If you're part of angel investment or government um, funding, uh, make it a condition of your funding for the development of a thing that security is built in from the first place. Don't put insecure options in thing security standards. So those of you who are involved in security standards, um, there are some security standards where for backwards in uh, compatibility, there's uh, an option which is known to be insecure, which is included in the security standard, maybe deprecated, but it's included. And if that one is the easier one to implement, that is the one that everyone will implement. <laughs> um, chuck out old things. Leonie uh, said this in her keynote. Uh, so if you have things in your company or in your house that you can no longer keep secure, chuck them out. Don't keep them hanging around. Um, you may have to do a fa factory reset as well. And finally, this is uh, part, of, part of what I just said, try not to be part of the problem. So when you buy or procure things for yourself or your businesses or for your organizations, do ask hard questions about security, and you know the right hard questions to ask. So uh, let's make things better. <laughs> OK. Now, anyone who wants shortbread can come get shortbread, and then we'll have questions. But first, I have a question for you. I imagine that there are some people in this room who've had interesting experiences with attacks on the Internet of Things. If you could talk about it, I'd be very interested to hear, um, say, 
what happened, whether it was an interesting thing, um, how you dealt with it, what the response was. Anything you feel like saying. Okay. Shortbread. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Thank you, Miranda. Any questions, comments, claims of biscuits? <laughs> come on, you need oh, sugar, it's Friday. <laughs> oh, uh, anyone who, who says anything also gets shortbread. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> come on, don't be shy. We have, we have four microphones. Yeah, come Yay. on, Derek, show us how it's done. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was, that was very entertaining, and, and this isn't quite as serious a, a question as I'd like. But were you put up to the fact that our outgoing chair works for Siemens before you gave them kudos for their incident <laughs> response policy? Because he's going to be in terminal to deal with for the next <laughs> month or two. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> well, thank you for making our life painful to have to deal with him today. <laughs> If Derek hadn't blown your cover, I was going to. <laughs> Hello. Ah, oh, okay. yes. On the yeah, other yeah. side. Hi. Right uh, so I'm Gauss. <laughs> I'm one of the vendors who is also making stuff. So when you said that uh, if it is old, chuck it out, replace it, it sounds easy. But when you have, I don't know, the whole refinery or smelter and then yeah. just chuck it out and replace it, it's not easy because number one, your sale guys mm. will kill you <laughs> when you even suggest to do such, such a kind of thing. Yes. So uh, I'm afraid, uh, yeah, I mean, in theory, I agree, but in practice, it's slightly more complex. Thank you for that very good point, yes. So uh, obviously there are other things you can do. You can try and block it as much as possible. You can also plan when you buy. Um, uh, there are some applications where you can't do it, smelted in. Um, uh, but when you're um, in the procurement in the first place, you think about the end of the life cycle as well. But uh, you're absolutely right. It's a more complex problem, and thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Are you lurking, Kauta, or...? Kaudo Wapio, National Cyber Security Center, Finland. It happens to be so that in our remit, uh, in a legal remit, is we actually have a right to scan the whole country. Mm. And it has been a very interesting... We do it actually... We, have, we do an annual scan every April, and, and, and the results are not getting better. <laughs> we are doing a, quite a bit of outreach on that. We are actually reaching uh, through the ISPs all the various automation systems that we encounter in, in the round. But the, um, even with, with, as we're going, doing the outreach, the numbers are not really, really, really going down. <coughs> and even we are also sharing the education. So there is a, quite a bit of work to do on this area. I must say. Thank you Just very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should say these are not vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll go. So, hi. I'm not doing this for the shortbread. Um, <laughs> Just wanted to share with you, um, I think the weirdest thing we found uh, on the internet, and that was the healing system of a ship. You know what the healing system is to mm -hmm. yes. stable? Uh, and the response from the vendor was maybe the most priceless. Uh, you know, we told them, and they, first they were, healing system? Yes. Wait a second, you need to talk to another guy. Okay. Yes, we have a healing system. Yeah, it's on the internet. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Finally, we had to send them a screenshot. It disappeared and reappeared a week later. Oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, 
I'm Carlos from the Portuguese NREM. Uh, first, a small disclaimer, uh, I don't need a cookie. <laughs> um, I'm not a gambler, but uh, if I was, uh, I would bet that when you asked about the state, uh, I would say you would show uh, a slide with a desert, but instead you, you show the slide with uh, some pants, <laughs> which is a, a, a bit optimistic than, than uh, I am. Right, you're, you're less optimistic. So thanks for this talk. Thank you very much. I can start a countdown. Well, I've got a countdown already. Um, if there are no others, thank you very much, Miranda. Thank you. <laughs> Every bit as amazing as I'd expected. Um, I, I have also tweeted that I'm hoping Inisa, who are based on Crete, are looking out for bronze robots, um, <laughs> <laughs> taking care of us. And I think at this point I hand over to Margot Thomas.